In today's readings, Holy Mother Church places before us the fall and ruin of the Jewish nation, who were once the chosen people of God. In the Gospel, we see our Lord weeping over Jerusalem and prophesying its destruction at the hand of the Roman legions under Titus and Vespasian. Well, in the epistle, St. Paul turns to the time of the Exodus and goes through a list of sins which resulted in their overthrow in the desert. Today we'll consider a few of the lessons placed before us in the epistle, but before we get to that, we need to make sure we all understand what a type is. A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, but it's also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. So type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, but it's also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Okay, let's turn to today's epistle. It's taken from chapter 10 of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In this passage, St. Paul speaks of the events of the Exodus. He explicitly uses the Greek word tupoi twice, which means type. When he tells us the events of the Exodus were types. In this passage, however, the word type has been translated as figure. We'll start with the first six verses of chapter 10 in order to put the epistle into context. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, St. Paul. For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all in Moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual food. And all drank the same drink. And they drank the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the desert. Now these things were done in a figure of us, that we should not covet evil things, as they also coveted. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. So the persons and events of the Exodus are types. St. Paul has given us a few examples. Let's just run over the, the, take a moment to run over these. Egypt is a land of sin, idolatry, and bondage. So what's it a type of? It's a type of the world, seated in darkness. Pharaoh, he's a man who wears the head of a serpent on his crown, is the ruler of this kingdom of sin. So what is he a type of? He's a type of Satan. His armies, those are the troops in service to Pharaoh, are pursuing the people of Israel to bring them back into bondage or to kill them. So what are they types of? They're types of the demonic hordes of hell. The passage through the Red Sea, the passage out of Egypt with the accompanying destruction of Pharaoh and his armies, what is that a type of? It's a type of baptism, as St. Paul has pointed out. The wandering through the desert for 40 years following the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire is a type of the Christian life following God. The spiritual food, the manna from heaven, is a type of the most blessed sacrament. Moses is the leader and the teacher of the people of God, and his brother Aaron is the high priest. The two of them, taken together, are collectively a type of the Pope, who is the leader, the teacher, and the high priest of the people of God of the New Testament. The promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, is a type of heaven. And so naturally the passage from the desert into the promised land is a type of the passage from this life of toil and trouble into the peace and joy of heaven. Now one of the most amazing things about all these types is we're not reading anything into them. God actually intended them to prefigure our New Testament realities. This is just a tiny overview. There's a lot more there to ponder. God actually wants us to ponder those things. That's why he inspired Moses to write all this down. That's why he inspired St. Paul to explicitly tell us that these things, quote, were written for our correction, close quote. And another way of translating that same line is that we could say that these things were, quote, written down for our instruction, close quote. So these things have been written down for our correction and for our instruction. Let's try to follow that lead and consider a few of the lessons contained in the remaining lines of the epistle and see how they apply to us today collectively and individually. St. Paul warns the believers in Corinth to be careful not to follow the example of the Jews of old, who indeed had the true religion and had been witnesses to all these spectacular miracles 
and their deliverance from Egypt, their passage through the Red Sea, being fed by the manna from heaven and water from the rock. And in spite of all that, precisely because of their desire for evil things, they had turned their hearts away from the Lord. And so they were overthrown in the desert. St. Paul also pointed out that that should serve as an example for us. So we don't desire evil things as they did. Now St. Paul is going to tell us exactly what evil things the people of Israel desire. Quote, Neither become ye idolaters, as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them that committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and perished by the serpent. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Excuse me. Okay, so St. Paul has just listed four grievous sins committed by the people of Israel in the desert. He's explicitly warning the Corinthians that the same sins which led to the destruction of the Jews in the desert will bring the Corinthians to ruin, should they be so careless as to fall into them. Let's take a quick, a closer look at each one of these sins. Verse 7. Neither become ye idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now here St. Paul is referring to the, the idolatrous worship of the golden calf. The, Israel's, the Egyptians, excuse me, the Egyptians worshipped a bulk, a bulk uh, god named Apis. And while Moses was up on the mountain, Aaron made a graven image of it. Here's an edited summary taken from Exodus chapter 32. Quote, Aaron made a molten calf, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Aaron built an altar before it and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Close quote. So St. Paul tells the Corinthians they must not become idolaters. Cornelius Elapide explains, quote, His meaning then is, See, O Corinthians, that you do not return to idols, nor eat of the things offered to them, and so become partakers of idolatrous sacrifices. Do not give yourselves up to games, to lust, and self-indulgence. Otherwise, like the Hebrews, you will be punished by God as apostates and idolaters, as gluttons and drunkards. Close quote. Now, the Corinthians are certainly not the only ones tempted to fall into idolatry. A friend of mine was deeply involved in the occult. He's a Wiccan, he's a a witch. In his house, he had what we might call a chapel. It was complete with an altar in the middle of a pentagram. Over time, as he became more proficient in casting spells, a demon would visibly appear, crouching on one corner of the pentagram. It had sort of a chalky appearance, but he could see through it. As he said, I know it sounds funny, even though this is a demon for hell, because I didn't believe in hell. Wick is a nature religion, and I thought I was just grounding myself deeper and deeper in nature, and so this demon was a spiritual being from another level of nature. But he said he didn't mess with it, and when he was done with his rituals, he backed out of the room. Now, after his miraculous conversion by the intercession of Our Lady, and that's a really good story, but we don't have time for that today, he said he got involved in Wicca by reading about it. This was years ago. And then he said, you know, not everyone that reads Harry Potter will do what I do. But everyone like me that reads Harry Potter will do what I did. Idolatry is a real present threat. St. Paul's warning is just as timely for us today as it was for the Corinthians. Verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them that committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now here St. Paul is referring to an incident that happened when the twelve tribes were camped in a place called Siddim on the plains of, of Moab. It's right across the Jordan River from Jericho. It's in modern-day Jordan. What happened is that Balaam, Balaam was a pagan sorcerer, 
was hired by the king of Moab to put a curse on the people of Israel. But God wasn't allowing it. In fact, every time Balaam tried to curse the people of Israel, he ended up blessing them. So he told the king that the Israelites were invincible as long as they remained faithful to their God. So Balaam counseled the king to send loose women among the Israelites in order to draw them away from the worship of their God and turn them toward the worship of idols. The particular idol mentioned in this passage of scripture is called the Alphagor. Now, I can't even read St. Jerome's description of this idol from the pulpit. It's probably never been translated in English. And as we're about to hear, Belphegor was worshipped with obscene behavior. Here's a slightly edited summary from Numbers chapter 25. Quote, And Israel at that time abode in Sedan, and the people committed fornication with the daughters of Moab, who called them to their sacrifices. And they ate of them and adored their gods. And Israel was initiated in Belphegor, Upon which the Lord, being angry, said to Moses, Take all the princes of the people and hang them up on gibbets against the sun, that my fury may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Let every man kill his neighbors that have been initiated to Baal-Fagor. And there were slain four and twenty thousand men. Close quote. Okay, before we comment on this, let's deal with an apparent problem. St. Paul says that in one day twenty-three thousand died, and Moses just said that twenty-four thousand died. The commentators give several explanations for this. Without going through them all, I will quote the one that today seems most convincing to me. Quote, How reconcile both accounts? There is no contradiction whatever. St. Paul says 23,000 in one day fell. Moses did not say 24,000 in one day. It is supposed that a thousand of the chiefs were slain on the first day and 23,000 of the people on the second day, to which St. Paul here refers. Close quote. Okay, to get some idea of what ancient Corinth was like, just consider that Aphrodite, you know, that's the pagan goddess of lust, was featured on the city's coins. And there were at least three pagan temples dedicated to her in the city. The general moral atmosphere was such that, quote, Athenian writers made Corinth the symbol of immorality. Aristophanes, now he's the, the Greek playwright, Aristophanes coined the verb Corinthiazestai, Corinthiazestai, which literally means to live like a Corinthian. So this verb means to live like a Corinthian, but Aristophanes used it to mean to fornicate. Plato used Corinthia Core, a Corinthian girl, to refer to woman of the night. Close quote. Well, although we don't have images of Aphrodite on our coins here, it's not as if our moral atmosphere is anything much to brag about. We've talked about some of this before. As of some years ago, 90% of 8- to 16-year-olds had viewed immoral sites online, most while doing homework. And 80% of 15- to 17-year-olds had had multiple exposures to the very worst sites. If you're going to have the Internet in your home, you must filter it. If your children have phones with Internet capabilities, it is your solemn obligation before God to either completely block the internet, unless it is absolutely essential that they have some kind of access, in which case it's your solemn obligation before God to get the most robust filter and or accountability where possible. The woman of the house should have the password. If your children have been exposed to this filth because of failure in your ear area, not only is it your fault, you've also almost guaranteed that they will have an incredible battle just to be saved. In other words, because of carelessness, some of your very own children may well be damned. Do not take this lightly. Especially mothers, don't think, my little Joey would never do such a thing. You do not know what it is like to be a boy or a young man. Trust the priest on this. Do not take this lightly. While we're on the topic of computer access, consider this excerpt from an article published in May. Quote, More than a third of divorce filings last year contained the word Facebook. According to a UK survey by Divorce Online, a legal services firm, And over 80% of U.S. divorce attorneys 
say they've seen a rise in the number of cases using social networking, according to the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. I see Facebook issues breaking up marriages all the time, says a divorce attorney in New London, Connecticut. Affairs happen with lightning speed on Facebook, says the author of the book Facebook and Your Marriage. In the real world, he says, office romances and out-of-town trysts can take months or even years to develop. On Facebook, he says, they happen in just a few clicks. The social network is different from most social networks or dating sites in that it both reconnects old flames and allows people to friend someone they may only met once in passing. It puts temptation in the path of people who would never in a million years risk having an affair, he says. Facebook declined to comment. Close quote. You don't need me to tell you that sexual immorality is a real present threat. St. Paul's warning is just as timely today for us as it was for the Corinthians. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and perished by the serpent. Here St. Paul is referring to an incident found in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Quote, The people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. Close quote. Now here we have the astonishing spectacle of the people blaspheming God after all he's done for them. He's led them out of Egypt. He's been feeding them with manna, what they just called loathsome food. He's been feeding them with this miracle bread from heaven. He's been providing them with water from the rock. And in return, they come back with this blasphemy. I will quote from a manual of moral theology. Quote, Blasphemy is a deliberate insult offered to the Lord God of heaven and earth. The most grievous sin a man can commit, assuming, of course, he acts with full advertence and consent. Close quote. St. Jerome states, quote, Nothing is more horrible than blasphemy. Indeed, compared to blasphemy, every sin is much lighter. Close quote. Now, blasphemy as a rule is an outburst of anger against God. It's principally a sin of the tongue, but blasphemous thought, writings, and actions are all equally offensive to God. To utter blasphemous words by force of a habit which one is actually earnestly trying to break is not a grievous sin, but there's a serious obligation to eradicate the habit. The person is responsible for having contracted the habit, and one is also responsible for any scandal you may have caused. Blasphemy is common not just in the speech of so many people in our society today, but it's also common in some types of popular music and certainly in the mass media, especially in certain television shows and movies. Blasphemy is a real present threat. St. Paul's warning is just as timely for us today as it was for the Corinthians. Verse 10. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now here St. Paul is referring to a terrifying incident that's found in the book of Numbers, chapter 16. Now I've condensed it. It's really worth reading chapter 16 in the book of Numbers. Quote, Now Kor, Kor is the first cousin of Moses and Aaron. Kor, Dathan, and Abiram took men, and they rose up against Moses with 250 leading men in the synagogue. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he said, It is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. But what is Aaron that you murmur against him? Then Moses said to call Dathan and Abiram, but they answered, We will not come. Then Moses said to the congregation, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know 
that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. If the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into hell, then you shall know that these men have blasphemed the Lord. And immediately as he made an end of speaking, the earth broke asunder under their feet and devoured them with their tents and all their substance. And they went down alive into hell, the ground closing upon them, and they perished from among the people. And a fire coming out from the Lord destroyed the 250 men that offered the incense. The following day, all the multitude of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And there rose a sedition, and the tumult increased. Moses and Aaron fled to the tabernacle of the covenant. And the Lord said to Moses, Get you out from the midst of this multitude. This moment I will destroy them. And Moses said to Aaron, Take the censer and go quickly to the people to pray for them. For already wrath has gone out from the Lord, and the plague rages. When Aaron had run to the midst of the multitude, which the burning fire was now destroying, he offered the incense. And standing between the dead and the living, he prayed for the people, and the plague ceased. And the number of them that were slain was 14,700 men, besides them that had perished in the sedition of Kor. Close quotes. Well, that is truly frightening. Cornelius Elapide says that these men fell down, quote, into hell, properly speaking. It is sufficiently obvious that they suffered eternal damnation and were thrust into hell, for this is clearly stated. And it happened that by the fury of God, they were immediately swallowed up in the very act of committing the crime. And hence, it does not appear they would have had the disposition of the time to repent. That they descended in eternal damnation in hell is the thinking of St. Epiphanius, St. Jerome, the Venerable Bede, St. Robert Bellamy, and others. Close quotes. A commentary on Psalm 105, verses 16 to 18, which recounts this incident, notes, Observe how God, who passed over the murmuring of the people against himself at the Red Sea, punished severely this rebellion against his servants. We may learn hence his wrath against such as despising his priests, withdrawing themselves from the fellowship of his people, form congregations of their own, set up altar against altar, and offer unlawful sacrifice instead of the true oblation of the Lord's body. Close quote. Now, as we've seen, Moses is the leader and the teacher of the people of God, and Aaron's a high priest, so collectively the two of them together are a type of the Pope, who is a leader, teacher, and high priest of the people of God in the New Testament. And what do we see these priests doing here? Rising up directly against God's appointed authority in the person of his duly appointed leaders and crying out, You have gone too far. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, if that sounds familiar to the older folks here, it should. Just listen to this statement reported in a Time magazine article entitled, Is Liberal Catholicism Dead? I love that title. Is Liberal Catholicism Dead? Quote, As the head of the Fordham University's theology department wrote recently, his generation discerned in the council a call to greater church democracy and an assertion of individual conscience that could stand up to the authority of even the Pope. So they battled the Vatican's birth control ban, its rejection of female priests, and insistence on celibacy, and its authoritarianism. Close quote. Now does that sound like the rebellion of Kor, Dathan, and Abiran, or what? His generation discerned in the council a call to greater church democracy, an assertion of individual conscience that could stand up to the authority of even the Pope. Because you have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? So they battled the birth, Vatican's birth control ban, its rejection of female priests, insistence on celibacy, and its authoritarianism. The head of Fordham's theology department continues, quote, for a couple of generations, progressivism was an important way to be Catholic. But I think the end of an era is here. Close quote. Well, thanks be to God for that. It can't come quickly enough. We also ought to keep in mind that God is defending the authority of Aaron 
Now Aaron actually made the golden calf. Stop and think about that for a while. That realization might help some folks keep things in perspective who allow themselves to break communion with the Pope, to refuse obedience to the Pope because of such issues as a CC1, a CC2, a CC3, kissing the Quran, and so forth. If God defended the authority of Aaron, he will certainly defend the authority of the Pope. In our day and age, it's not just the liberals that have made this terrifying mistake about the papacy. Let us pray that the end of this era is also here. The Haydock Commentary states, quote, The crime of these men, which was punished in so remarkable a manner, was that of schism and of rebellion against the authority established by God in the church and the pretending of the priesthood without being lawfully called and sent. The same is the case of all modern sectaries. Let them dread a similar punishment. Not only the authors of such wicked pretensions, but those also who consent to them. For we find that Kor and all his adherents were buried in hell, and those likewise who complained that their punishment was too severe fell victims to the raging fire. St. Ignatius of Antioch points out that Kor and his companions did not attack the law directly, but resisted Moses and Aaron. St. Cyprian states that they believed in the same God, yet because they took upon themselves to sacrifice, they were forthwith punished by God, and their unlawful sacrifices could do them no service. Thus we are warned to keep in the true church and obey those who are set over us and never for any temporal consideration whatever to encourage by our presence the sermons or meetings of heretics or of schismatics lest we perish with them. Close quote. And we see the thousands that perish because they follow the leaders. But there's one very hopeful note in Numbers 26. We read it at verse 10. Quote, And there was a great miracle wrought that when Kor perished, his sons did not perish. Close quote. And Cornelius of Lapide explains, quote, When Kor perished, his sons did not perish. But when the earth opened up and swallowed the tents of Kor, they were suspended in the air because they did not consent to their father's rebellion. Close quote. The prophet Samuel is actually descended from the sons of Kor. Now, I personally find this very consoling. I tend to think of those who are not in actual union with the Pope, but through no fault of their own, and with goodwill, a spirit of being open to the truth, as being like the sons of Kor in our own day and age. Schism and rebellion against the authority of God is a real present threat. St. Paul's warning is just as timely as it today for us as it was for the Corinthians. Let us read the last lines of today's epistle. Now all these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore he thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold on you, but such as is human. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make with also a temptation issue that you may be able to bear it. Close quote. We'll close with some reflections from that great Benedictine, Dom Guéranger. Quote, Learn a lesson from the fall of the Jews. If you are faithful to call of God's grace, he will be faithful to you and preserve you from temptations which you could not resist. And yet, never forget that the same causes which brought about the destruction of the Jews would also lead you to ruin. They fell because of their unbelief. You are now what you are by faith. Be not, therefore, high-minded with self-complacency, but remember how God will not spare you if you cease to be faithful. And whilst you do well to admire his mercy, you do not do wisely if you forget his inexorable justice. Close quote. We are what we are now by faith. Never forget that the same causes which brought about the destruction of the Jews would also lead us to ruin.